one of the most important loads uh, uh, category of loads are those formed by induction machines. In fact, uh, we also discussed in the previous class that induction machines are used in another context as generators uh, in uh, many wind farms. Now, uh, so it was uh, in the previous class I told you how uh, from a basic synchronous machine model for example, the 1.1 model uh, the model in which you got one rotor winding on the d axis and one on the q axis you can modify it. So, as to get uh, a induction machine model for that you would have to set the field voltage to 0. Uh, remove all kinds of salient behavior for example, x d and x u you would have to make uh, to a to a value x okay, and x d dash and x q dash also would be equal. So, if you did, uh, did that kind of thing and even made a time constants on both axis the same you would come uh, across a uh, induction machine model from the original synchronous machine model. So, let us just uh, review what uh, we are going to do in today's lecture today is the 32nd lecture and uh, we will be continuing a bit of our discussion on induction machines and uh, we will try to cover a bit of transmission line modeling also in this lecture. Okay. So, uh, if you recall in the previous class we had done uh, static and dynamic models of uh, we had discussed the nature of static uh, frequency and voltage dependent loads and uh, we had begun on our induction machine model. Now, uh, uh, in the previous class the point at which we left off was uh, some of the issues when it came to uh, induction machine models. Although, I did mention that you can have in fact, uh, in induction machine model obtained uh, from uh, the synchronous machine model. There are few issues which uh, naturally will come to your mind. Uh, for example, what do you mean by rotor angle in a con in a situation where there is really no saliency in the machine. Okay. So, you cannot really uh, align your axis to any particular uh, in any particular direction uh, with respect to the rotor because the rotor is exactly symmetrical. Okay, so that was one issue which uh, we need to tackle. So uh, if you look at the synchronous machine equations, they seem to be having a rotor angle dependence. So how do we actually uh, show that induction machines, in fact, are not dependent on the rotor angle? Although you can get an induction machine model by uh, you know. Uh, just modifying a synchronous machine model. So, if you look at the basic equations which we had discussed last time, the if the induction machine model is obtained from a synchronous machine model uh, by neglecting EFD and setting all the transient time constants and uh, transient reactances and of course, the steady state reactance is equal on the d and q axis. Okay. So, this was the model for the 1.1 model on the d axis and uh, for the q axis this is what we have. So, uh, what you notice here of course, is uh, in both these equations both on the d and the q axis uh, the last equation for example, here is dependent on v d okay. and uh, the next one here the q axis equations you have got v q here. Now, uh, if you assume a three phase sinusoidal source Okay, a sinusoidal uh, balance source uh, of a constant frequency and you use uh, Parkes transformation okay, that is depending on the rotor position. Then you will find that V d and V q become delta dependent. Uh, as I mentioned some time back delta is only notional it is a kind of a uh, abstraction in the context of a induction machine it can be anywhere, but the point is does it affect eventually the observables are choice of uh, the d uh, the d axis and the q axis okay so in uh, in other words does the rotor angle matter eventually the answer is no and uh, proving it is not e uh, is not just uh, you know it is not cannot be shown for example in a couple of steps here what we will do is uh, this something which will come on, come in useful even later okay what we will do is reformulate the same equations using another transformation. Okay. Now, this seems to be a kind of a, a kind of a com, uh, complication, but sooner or later as, as you start working in power system dynamics you will kind of get used to this change of reference frames. Okay. So, our normal reference frame of course, before we go there uh, let us just uh, repeat what we did last time that is the x to be used in these equations is nothing but in terms of the typical parameters of an induction machine. Uh, x is equal to excess the leakage reactance of the stator p 
plus the mutual reactance okay, of the stator. X dash in fact is obtained from the second equation. In this X r is the rotor leakage referred to the stator okay. and uh, T dash similarly is uh, defined at the bottom with uh, R r, R r being the resistance of the rotor winding. Okay. So, this kind of uh, these are the parameters uh, which are used in the model 1.1 model, but for an induction machine they can be related to the cell uh, the leakage as well as the mutual uh, reactances as shown in this slide. Okay. Now, uh, remember that a torque equation is uh, the same it is i d i q minus psi q i d and uh, we have used in this equation the Parkes transformation. Okay. So, where theta is the position of the rotor it is omega t plus delta. Okay. Now, let me introduce you to, to you another transformation C k in fact, it is also called Kronz transformation. The difference between the transformation before and now is that instead of theta which is omega naught t plus delta you have got in this transformation the argument of the cosines and sines contain just omega naught t they do not have delta. So, this is not the same as the previous transformation. So, if I use this transformation to transform to a new set of variables from a b c as shown in this slide that is instead of transforming to the small d q lower case d q 0 variables you transform a b c using c k into the variables f d, f q, f and f naught. Okay. And uh, it is you can really show that eventually the lower case f d, f q and f 0 are related to the f upper case d q and 0 by the relationship which is given below that is f q plus j f d upper case is equal to f q plus j f d lower case into e raise to j delta. This is a compact way of uh, writing this. In fact, uh, you can really f a f b f c is equal to c p into f d f q and f 0 is equal to c k. This is another transformation which gets you somewhere else it is another set of variables. Okay. So, it follows that f d f q and f 0 is nothing but c k inverse c p into f d f q and f 0. So, from this if you evaluate this it can be compactly written down in fact, f 0 of course, in these both uh, in these transformation f 0 are the same, okay. but f d and f q upper case are related to f d and f q lower case by this transformation. Okay. Now, this is I uh, will not derive it here, but you can compactly write it as shown in the slide that is f q plus j f d is equal to f q plus j f d into e raise to j delta. What I am trying to say here is since the rotor angle in the case of a induction machine or rotor position uh, in case of an induction machine is a bit uh, of an abstraction the rotor angle is a bit of an abstraction because there is no saliency uh, in the rotor. Uh, it makes sense to reformulate our differential equations not in terms of the Parkes transformation, but in terms of the Kronz transformation which is a which contains uh, omega naught t as the arguments of the sines and the cosines okay? and uh, omega naught of course, uh, is a constant in this case. Okay? There is no delta coming into the picture. Okay? So, we use such a transformation instead of Parkes transformation. So, this is what is very important. So, if I actually reformulate the equations uh, you know in the capital D q frame of reference I will call it the capital D q frame of reference or the Kronz uh, frame of reference. The equations look similar with this additional term. So, if I write down uh, you know for example, d psi capital D by d t the equations for it look the same except here you get omega naught. Okay. So, this is one change you will see. 
another uh, important thing is I have also changed the variables psi capital G and psi capital F to the new frame. So, actually if you look at the new variables psi g k and psi f k in fact, they are related to these old variables. So, if I do that you know I just substitute for the old equations with the new variables your differential equations look like this in the new variables. So, you have got now new variables psi f k psi capital D on the d axis and similarly on the q axis psi g k and psi q. Okay. Now, what is the advantage of doing this? I mean, why are we writing down the equations uh, in terms of different variables? Now, the important thing here is if your source uh, is a three phase balance source of frequency omega naught, you will find that V q, V capital Q uh, or upper case Q and V capital D are in fact independent of delta. In fact, you will find that they are constants okay, which are independent of delta. So, although the earlier differential equations of the induction machine were certainly valid, what we have done is come to a form in which we, uh, the inputs V d and V q are in fact constant in the new variables, okay, in the new new transformed variables. Okay. They are not dependent on delta. So, it is better to get rid of the concept of delta or the abstraction of delta in case you do not have a salient pole machine, okay, like in an induction machine. So, the important thing of course, is something which you can prove using this basic relationship which I have shown you here on the uh, written slide. You can show that of course, and I d plus j i q sorry is equal to i q sorry this should be q and this should be d and this should be q and this should be d. So, if I actually compute psi d i q minus psi q i d, it will turn out that it is equal to psi d i q minus psi q i d. So, what I want to say here is of course, that the torque equation also the electrical torque is independent of delta, it is not dependent on delta. So, I have formulated my equations in the Kronz variables or uh, using a transformation which is you can say rotating at a constant frequency. Okay. Instead of using Parkes transformation, I am able to formulate my equations of an induc induction machine so that it is independent of delta. And of course, that also means that the rotor angle is not important in some sense. Okay. So, we know for example, that an induction machine uh, under steady state conditions under load or no load, uh, uh, in fact, under loaded conditions, its speed is not equal to the frequency or the electrical speed of the machine is not equal to the frequency of the source to which it is connected to. In fact, if you load an induction machine, you get a slip. Okay. Now, if you took the classical definition of uh, delta, that delta is nothing but theta is equal to omega t is equal to omega naught t plus delta. You see that in case the speed of the induction machine is different from the uh, speed of the transformation and therefore, also of, uh, as I have told you it is also equal to the frequency of the voltage it is connected to voltage source to which the induction machine is connected to. We will see that delta is constantly varying if omega naught equal to omega naught and you know that uh, induction machine can operate stably even this is even if this is true. In fact, there is always a steady state slip when you load the machine. So, what I have done here really here is uh, come to a formulation using the Kronz transformation, which is completely independent of theta and the induction machine in some sense can happily operate okay, at a speed which is different from the, uh, the omega naught. Okay. Now, uh, this is not true of a synchronous machine. In a synchronous machine, in fact, uh, you will find that you uh, you will find that the torque in fact is a function of delta, it is related in some way to delta. Okay. 
So, uh, in case delta is not a constant, in such a case, uh, you will find that uh, the torque is also not a constant, but this is not true as far as an induction machine is concerned. Okay. So, it may be a good idea in uh, an induction machine to formulate your equations in the capital D Q frame, okay. but you could formulate your equations in the you know the Parkes reference frame as well, okay. but uh, the, in, the changing delta whenever there is a slip is of no consequence eventually. So, that is what uh, really I wish to tell you here. So, uh, you can get uh, the induction machines as uh, equations as I mentioned to you. Uh, a few more points. First thing is what is the torque equation of a of the machine? I told you we are working with the the torque equation in fact is exactly the same this is the per unit torque of a machine. In fact, this is correct where T is nothing but what I had written some time before, it is this. Okay. So, this is the differential equation which you have to use along with the differential equations of um, the various fluxes that is psi d, psi q, psi g k and psi f k. Alternatively, you can also use psi d, psi q, psi g and psi k but remember delta will keep on varying in these equations. Okay. So, in steady state you will not find psi d, psi q, psi j and psi k as constants. Since this is not a function of delta, t is not a function of delta, you do not really actually have to write the separate equation for delta itself. Okay. Nothing if you formulate your equations this way, you do not really have to write the delta equation at all, the differential equation corresponding to delta at all, because delta never appears in any of these equations. Okay. Now, uh, one of the important things of course, is this is uh, the equation of an induction uh, machine. In fact, it is uh, derived from the equation of the synchronous machine, but uh, if you want to operate, uh, you want to really study the operation of a motor instead of a generator, it is important to uh, remember that we when we first formulated this swing equation or this in case of a synchronous machine, the directions of T m and T were as follows. We assume that your machine is moving in this direction and T is like this, T m is like this. Okay. So, it is correct to say that the speed of the induction machine okay, is equal to T m minus T e. In a motor, In a motor, remember that T m is in fact in the opposite direction of the speed of rotation. So, if you are in a motoring mode, T m is in fact minus T l dash, where T l dash is the mechanical load on the machine. Okay. So, you do not have a T m in a synchronous machine, a synchronous generator T m would have been the prime mover torque, but now the load torque on a motor would be minus T l. So, if I am writing down the equation, this is the speed of the machine, rate of change of the speed of the machine, this is not slip remember, this is speed of the machine is equal to minus of T l in case it is a motor with T l in this direction, then you will have minus T l minus Now, just remember of course, that whenever we are writing this is a correct equation, there is nothing wrong in this equation. Okay. So, it is minus T l minus of uh, this psi d i q minus this. Okay. So, this is correct, there is nothing wrong in this equation. You see the direction of speed T is this expression for T is in this direction. Okay. T in this direction is given by this expression. T l is in this direction. Okay. So, this is the correct equation, but uh, one more small uh, or rather somewhat minor point is in case you are studying a motor, another change you would probably like to do is uh, assume that the currents I d and I q are going into the motor okay, rather than coming out of the motor. In our generator convention, we had assumed that the currents are going out. So, these currents are in fact, the currents coming out of the machine. So, all the in all the equations wherever current appears, 
it is referring to the current going out of the machine. Okay. So, of course, if you change the direction of the current, this will have a positive sign here and similarly, uh, in other places you will have to change the sign okay, in case you change the direction of the current. Okay. So, this is something which you should remember that in case you are taking the direction of current inward, then you have to change the sign of this. Then our equations are absolutely self consistent, there is no problem with them. Okay. So, this is regarding the motor convention. The second uh, point which uh, I would like to talk uh, is uh, about T L itself. T L itself is the mechanical load on the machine. A particular load has a uh, you know normally we would like to characterize uh, each mechanical load also by some torque speed characteristic. Now, uh, for example, a fan you know you can have a if you have a fan you will find that its torque speed characteristic is something like this the torque versus the speed. Okay. So, this is the torque speed this is the load okay. this is the load torque versus speed characteristic and of course, if you have got an induction machine which is driving this fan then the operating speed is given by the point at which both these things intersect. Okay. So, this is the operating speed of the machine. So, uh, or rather the steady state speed of the machine. Okay. So, this is the steady state speed of the machine. Now, one of the uh, points which you should appreciate at this juncture is that in case, so if you look at the torque speed characteristics of an induction machine, the electrical torque versus speed okay, and uh, this is the load characteristics, this is the load versus speed for a fan type load for a maybe you may can also think of constant power uh, torque loads. For example, if you are lifting up something you know like a through a lift, then the torque is a constant, it is not a function of the speed torque is nothing but the mass into gravity uh, means it is proportional to the mass and the gravity which is being lifted, the mass which is being lifted against the gravitational force. Now, the operating speed as I mentioned was this. Now, suppose an interesting point here is that suppose this of course, frequency here is omega naught at uh, when the slip is 0 or the speed of the mechanical speed of the machine becomes equal to omega naught, the electrical torque becomes 0. Okay. Now, an interesting thing is if a frequency changes, what happens to the torque? If frequency changes, you will find the torque speed characteristic in fact, the torque speed characteristic in fact changes and uh, it becomes 0 at some other mechanical speed. Okay. Because of this, you will find, so if there is a small change in the torque, you will find this point slightly shifts and the operating speed also changes. In fact, the amount of the even the torque changes. Okay. So, what you find is if you are driving a fan type load, okay, you will find that if the electrical frequency changes from omega naught to omega naught dash. So, the source frequency changes from omega naught to omega naught dash, the power output of such a motor would reduce okay? and therefore, the input power also would reduce to, to, a, to a certain extent. So, in fact, if you got a fan type mechanical load, it also implies that the steady state uh, load of your machine, the electrical load of your machine is frequency dependent. Okay? So, this is something which uh, in fact, this is one of the mechanisms by which load becomes frequency dependent. Okay? Uh, we will conclude this our discussion of induction machine with a simple uh, interesting dynamical example. This is not something to do with our classical power systems analysis, but nonetheless uh, we are at a point where we can actually analyze this system. That is the behavior of a induction machine which is connected to just a set of capacitors. Okay? So, if you have got an induction machine and you connect to say a star connected bank of capacitors like this. Okay, the stator windings are connected to a star connected bank of capacitors and suppose the induction machine is being driven, this is not a motor, suppose it is a, uh, it is basically like a generator, it is being driven by some prime mover at a constant speed. Let us assume this. So, there is a prime mover which is rotating the induction machine at a constant speed and the induction machine stator is not connected to a voltage source, 
but it is connected to a bank of capacitors. In such a case, a very interesting thing is which is observed in practice is that the induction machine self excites that is you will find that some voltage appears here. Okay. So, if there is some residual magnetism in the machine or there is some residual charge on the capacitor, you will find that automatically if you of course, connect an appropriate value of the C's, this is a balanced star connected C, you will find that the machine suddenly self excites. So, this is a, a, by the way a very from a physical perspective a very, very interesting phenomena. It practically says that uh, if you have got uh, a bank of capacitors, which is basically just uh, uh, you know metal and dielectric and you have got a machine, which is just a ferromagnetic material in copper and you rotate the machine, uh, lo and behold you have got some voltage uh, appearing at uh, the terminals of the machine, you know without having any other magnet or battery available with you. Okay. So, this is uh, something very interesting uh, about self excitation as a phenomena and uh, what I wanted to tell you here today is that with the tools which you have right now at your disposal, you should be able to show that self excitation occurs. What exactly is self excitation? you rotate a machine with uh, you know z uh, practically you know uh, with no excitation source except the fact that the machine is being rotated by a prime mover at a certain speed say the rated speed and what you want to show is that uh, if there is some uh, you know small however small an initial condition you will find that voltage grows okay and the machine self excites eventually of course what you normally find in practice is that the voltage grows up to a point uh, and settles down because of uh, uh, saturation of the ferromagnetic material which cons uh, which constitutes the uh, induction machine. Okay. So, if you look at it from a mathematical perspective and analytical perspective, what you have to do is write down the equations of the induction machine. Okay. So, we have for example, written down the equations of an induction machine. You do not worry about the torque, we will assume that the prime mover is, uh, is somehow maintaining the speed of the machine a constant. So, the equations of the induction machine are as shown in these slides. So, the first three equations, two differential equations and one algebraic equation and the q axis equations. Okay. So, these are the equations of the induction machine, you will have to just interface them with the equations of uh, the capacitor bank okay, in the d q frame of reference. Okay. Now, remember uh, we have not written down the 0 sequence equation, we will assume absolutely a balanced setup and therefore, the 0 sequence equations are completely decoupled. So, we do not have to include them in this analysis, okay. they are decoupled completely from uh, this our set of d q equations. So, what do you need to do? Well, what you need to do here is write down the equation of the capacitance, uh, capacitors. Okay. So, if you look at the equations as they are given here, you will find that uh, the equations of the capacitor are C, C and C. D B A N by D T is equal to the current I A, I B and I C. So, what you get here is if you transform these using the transformation C k, okay, what you will find is this is something I leave as an exercise to you d v d by d t is equal to In fact, this will be omega omega naught c. Okay. So, if actually if I write these equations again, so we will have d v d by d t is equal to minus omega naught 
QBQ plus ID by C and you'll have of course okay now uh, we can write this in per unit form in which case you will have dvd by dt is equal to minus omega naught vq now these are in per unit plus id per unit divided by c per unit but in case you are in per unit, you can also write it the uh, C in per unit is the same as the susceptance in per unit. Okay? So, this one, so normally you will be given the susceptance in per unit. So, that is why I am writing it in this form. Now, the differential equations corresponding to this plus the differential equations corresponding to psi d, psi q, psi g k and psi f k can be combined together. I mean you can write the, the whole thing down as in the form x dot is equal to a x. Okay. There is no other source of excitation, there is no other source of excitation. We will assume speed is constant. Okay. So, we do not write down the prime mover mechanical equations, we just assume that the speed is constant. Now, what you need to do is of course, what are the equilibrium conditions? X is equal to 0, I mean all the states are equal to 0 is an equilibrium condition. Then what you need to do is find the eigenvalues of A for different values of B C. And what you will find very surprisingly is that such a system will have eigenvalues with real part less than 0 if B C is greater than a certain value. In fact, B C is greater than a certain value which is related to the reactances. You can actually get the condition explicitly. Okay? So, a very, very interesting thing can be analyzed mathematically that self excitation will occur in an induction machine uh, if connected to a bank of capacitors and driven by a constant uh, speed prime mover, you will find that at a, uh, at a certain value of those capacitors, the system is unstable at the equilibrium point as a result of which you will find that uh, you know you will find that some voltage appears you know for any non-zero initial condition which exists. So, it may be some residual flux in the machine or some residual charge on the capacitor then the machine will just simply self excite. So, it is a very uh, you know, uh, interesting and exciting phenomena. Of course, uh, one uh, important point which in this case is very critical is that uh, the equations which I have derived for the synchronous machine as well as the induction machine are shown to be linear. Now, remember that uh, if you have a linear system and it is unstable, it, you will find that for any non-zero initial condition of the states, it will simply the system will simply blow up. Okay, it will just go on increasing to infinity. Uh, this does not happen in practice, and the reason is that the ferromagnetic parts of the machine tend to saturate. Now, if that happens, it what it also means is that our model here, uh, linear model here, is inadequate to capture that phenomenon because it's a linear model. So, in fact, uh, sometime uh, before. I had mentioned to you that there are uh, you know ways uh, which are not very theoretically uh, you know provable kind of ways to account for saturation of a of a synchronous or an induction machine. If you actually did manage to account for saturation and make this model non-linear, okay, in that case you you uh, ought to have been able to show that there would be another equilibrium point. Okay, and the system would go to that new equilibrium point. That equilibrium point is not a zero equilibrium point. Okay, so what I mean to say is that with saturation, the system becomes x dot is equal to f of x. This is a linear system which we are handling right now. Okay, what we have we probably what the thing which you can prove is that if B C is greater than a certain value, you will find that at the equilibrium point x is equal to 0, this system is unstable and therefore, the system tends to self excite. Okay? If you take the nonlinear system 
first of all you may be having more than one equilibrium point if you take into account saturation and one of the equilibria is stable and the other is unstable so if you look at self excitation you will find that the system kind of uh, you know settles down to a new uh, you know let's say an equilibrium periodic equilibrium okay so that is one interesting uh, thing which you can further chew upon i'll now show you uh, an uh, videographed experiment uh, which really shows the self excitation phenomena uh, what we'll be seeing in this uh, demonstration is in fact a uh, self excited induction generator which is driven by a dc generator which maintains the speed practically a constant rather uh, induction uh, self excited we'll just do this again once more what i'll be showing you now is a experimental demonstration of self excitation phenomena in this experiment we have an induction generator which is driven by a dc motor which keeps the speed of uh, uh, keeps the speed of rotation constant and uh, we'll connect a bank of capacitors across the induction machine what you will see is of course that uh, if the amount of capacitance is adequate uh, you can actually have uh, voltage build up at the induction generator uh, at the output of the induction machine terminals okay so that really shows you what is known as self excited induction machine uh, uh, phenomena okay so now let us uh, see the demonstration so what you are seeing here is a dc machine dc motor which is cup and this of course is the bank three bank three banks of delta connected capacitors each with a switch which we shall connect uh, across uh, the induction machine terminals okay so the dc uh, motor will drive this induction machine which you are seeing and we shall of course monitor the output voltage through one of these uh, probes which is uh, fed to this uh, oscilloscope okay so what we'll do now is uh, start this machine dc motor there is one more motor uh, one more machine right in, in the middle also but that is playing no role as it is not energized there there's one in the middle also yeah so the dc motor has been started the machine on the left so we build up the speed and uh, you see that the output voltage at the induction machine there is probably some residual magnetism because which you get little bit of voltage okay but it's not really much so what is happening is now i will switch on one of the banks of the capacitors okay but you see that uh, really there is no voltage really building up at the induction machine terminals that's just a little bit uh, probably due to the residual magnetism one of my students is removing one additional probe which is not required for this experiment it has no bearing on the outcome of the experiment of course okay now we'll switch on the second bank and what you see is the voltage builds up spontaneously at the terminals of the induction machine so this is an example of uh, self excitation if i switch off uh, the capacitor bank one of the uh, one of those capacitor banks then you see that the machine gets de excited and you will voltage will no longer be sustained okay so we'll do this experiment again uh, we'll switch on this capacitor bank again but remember that the capacitor bank may have some residual charge on it so what we need to do is uh, discharge these capacitors the de agent energized capacitors so we'll just discharge it through a resistance so we see uh, what that's what we are doing right now we'll discharge it yeah okay yeah uh, there is no need of doing that because it's not uh, energized it was not energized anyway so now we'll just re restart redo that yeah so you see that the machine self excites again so you can have an induction machine self excitation uh, by connecting capacitors across it so this is uh, so much about uh, induction machine models remember that 
when you've got large induction machines, you may have to model them in power system studies. So, for example, large power plant auxiliaries or induction machines in large industries, you may have to model it by a dynamical model. Alternatively, you can try to even model smaller induction machines or in some cases even larger machines depending on the nature of the study you are interested in by a static polynomial kind of model. I told you that an induction machine would say with a fan load, if you look at its static characteristics, it shows a frequency dependence. Okay. So uh, let us now move on to uh, another uh, you know, equipment or another component of a power system which is absolutely important uh, is a transmission line. You know, uh, transmission line is an element, it is a distributed parameter element in the sense that uh, uh, it is defined by, uh, you know, if you look at the, if you look at it from first principle, in fact, all electrical equipment from first principles uh, would satisfy Maxwell's equations. But if you look at uh, uh, some, the low frequency behavior of uh, transmission lines, you can model them by, uh, by distributed parameter equivalent, where you have got shunt capacitances and series inductances, but these are distributed parameter devices. So, uh, the basic mathematical equations which, which describe a transmission line are given as follows. So, if I just write down this, um, the equations. So, if you have got a point K, this analysis uh, practically follows what is given in Sauer and Pi's book. Okay. So, if this is I call x is equal to 0 point of the transmission line, this is x is equal to d, it is a transmission line element with uh, of length d. In that case, uh, uh, and x is measured in this fashion. So, you have got this is v of x okay, and we we'll assume current is in this direction i of x. Then uh, the equations of the transmission line r, this is something of course, I would not derive. It is a big exercise in itself to from the basic Maxwell equations to show that these are the roughly the equations which describe the transmission line for 50 hertz kind of uh, behavior. So, these are the equations of uh, the transmission line. Okay, They are partial differential equations and uh, the current directions and voltages at a distance x are described by these equations. Okay. Now, R, L, G and C are per unit length parameters. Okay. So, uh, just one small note of caution because you may think L is in Henry. No, it is Henry per unit length okay. and C is capacitance per unit length. Okay. So, just this is an important thing. These are the partial differential equations which describe transmission line, you know, especially for power, uh, you know, power frequency behavior. Okay. So, most of our, um, equ uh, these equations are valid for that kind of thing. Okay. Now, the solution of, uh, the general solution of uh, these equations is something which you have done in your undergraduate years in uh, a course on electromagnetics or perhaps uh, even in maths or power systems itself is uh, the current at any time t and uh, distance x from from one end is given by just a moment we we'll just uh, have this in view so v of x at a distance x from this this side is given by so we are just following the notation of sauer and pi where in this when you are uh, this of course is true only for a lossless line that is r is equal to g is equal to 0 the resistance and the susceptance uh, the conductance shunt conductance per unit length is actually 0 so in that case we get what is known as the wave solution of 
these partial differential equations okay and where c is equal to 1 by root lc and zc is equal to root of l of c okay this is the uh, 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 the dimensions of ohms of a resistance and this is in fact the speed okay propagational velocity so it has got uh, the dimension of distance per unit time okay so of course it is important to note that this equation this solution is valid only for a lossless line okay ehv lines in fact uh, you will find that they come to this close to this lossless behavior okay the resistance is low compared to the reactive components uh, that is the resistance per unit length as compared to the x per unit length is much smaller okay remember that this functions f1 and f2 really dependent are dependent on the what what are the conditions on the boundary so if i tell you about the conditions at the boundary for example what is connected at one end and what is connected at the other end uh, and i tell you its behavior with respect to time in that case i should be able to tell you what the behavior of i at any other i or v at any point on the line okay so this is a a, a solution which is valid for a lossless line okay now the point of course which i want to make here is that uh, this is the solution of a transmission line under uh, transient conditions of a lossless line under transient conditions if you are talking about the sinusoidal steady state if you are talking of sinusoidal steady state behavior in such a case you you must be recalling that if i take a transmission line this is k and this is m I will be able to mimic or at least capture the behavior under sinusoidal steady state conditions. What do we mean by sinusoidal steady state conditions? For example, I apply a voltage source here and a weight okay, for all the transients to settle down okay. and then I measure for example, the terminal behavior here. You know, I find out for example, what is the voltage which appears here. Say this line is open circuited. Okay. Then when I say sinusoidal steady state means that after all the transients have died down, what is the behavior. Okay? So, you have uh, already done this uh, sometime previously uh, in your undergraduate years. So, if I call this as uh, you know z s and y s s h okay? z series and y shunt, you will find that z series is equal to yeah is equal to z bar into sin of gamma bar d by gamma bar d sin h okay hyperbolic cinch function okay and this y s h is equal to y bar by 2 hyperbolic tan function okay so in fact so if you take the sinusoidal steady state response okay you can use this pi circuit you can use this pi circuit with an impedance z series impedance and the shunts shunt admittance given by these values where z bar is equal to r dash d d is of course the distance and y bar is equal to g dash t plus j omega s and uh, omega s is of course the frequency of the sinusoidal sources okay so when you are talking of sinusoidal steady state the frequency which corresponds to those sinusoid uh, sinusoids are omega s okay and of course root of z y z bar y bar divided by d square so this is the sinusoidal steady state representation of a transmission line as a two port network. Okay?
remember that this is this solution is valid only for sinusoidal steady state conditions. So, as is mentioned in uh, the book by Sovereign Pi, it, we should resist the temptation of trying to use this lumped pi equivalent, two port equivalent of a transmission line under sin, which is valid under sinusoidal steady state conditions. We should resist the temptation of using it for all kinds of transient analysis. So, often you will find, uh, you know, for example, very implicitly, uh, people for example, represent a transmission line even under trans even under transmission uh, transient conditions by a series inductance, a short transmission line by series inductance, and then write down the transient equations L d i by d t lumped transient equations like this. Now, is this correct or no? That is the basic uh, doubt you may have. So, let me just tell you what uh, the situation is. You have got the differential partial differential equation corresponding to uh, the behavior of a transmission line, which to some extent can be said to be physically valid for uh, the studies normally encountered uh, uh, at uh, for power system uh, in power system analysis. You can use the distributed parameter differential partial differential equation model. it has got a wave like solution in transients okay it has got traveling wave kind of solution okay under sinusoidal steady state conditions you will find that the behavior of a transmission line can be represented by a two port network consisting of lumped a lumped pi network okay now can we the question is can we utilize this lumped pi equivalent which comes the r and l corresponding to the lumped pi you know you have got the uh, this impedance z series and y shunt which we just wrote down can we use them okay for example if uh, if you look at this y series and shunt if you look at the equations which come about you will get basically a plus j b then you divided divide this b divided by omega s that will give you the equivalent inductance to be used in this sinusoidal steady state model and then used use the lumped parameter differential equation once we get the l from this okay and then use it in our analysis for transient behavior we should avoid this temptation because rather we can, in fact we do it sometimes okay so the question is is it valid the answer is strictly speaking no it's not valid but uh, under certain circumstances you will get close behavior to what you observe uh, rather you can use this kind of approximation of of representing a transmission line by lumped parameters obtained from a sinusoidal steady state model Okay, but of course you will be create, uh, committing some errors because this is not really how how the transmission line behaves during transients. It's a traveling wave behavior. So uh, there is a example given in Sovereign Pi's book which is very apt and uh, in which he has asked us to find out. Yeah, it's basically an example here from Sovereign Pi. You've got a voltage source V S. Okay and it is connected to a resistance of 10 ohms. This voltage source is switched on. This voltage source is a sinusoidal voltage source. It is 230 kilo volts line to line. Okay. So, we are just talking of a single phase model of a transmission line. Okay. It is a 230 kilo volt uh, line to line system. So, the phase to neutral of this will be 230. Uh, divided by root 3 and the peak value is 230 into root 2 by 3. So, this is the voltage source here. Okay, It is a sinusoidal voltage source of 60 hertz. So, you have 2 pi into 60 into t. This is switched on through a resistance of 10 ohms to a 100 mile transmission line, distributed parameter transmission line with parameters L and C given as 1.5 milli henry per mile and uh, capacitance per unit length is 0 0.02 microfarad per mile. Okay. Now, the 
thing we need to check is when we do the simulation of this, how to do the simulation of this is something we will discuss in the next class. When we do the simulation of this and compare it with what we get if we simulate a lumped equivalent same same system except that now we are going to use a lumped equivalent. I am sorry, you will have an inductance series inductance lumped equivalent of the lossless line okay so we have to compare the behavior of this model of a trans uh, distributed parameter model of a transmission line with what happens if you take a lumped equivalent of a transmission line based on the sinusoidal steady state representation okay so that's an interesting thing uh, and uh, we'll compare the results and uh, discuss this problem in more detail in the next class.